Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Hello, listeners. Thanks again for tuning in. I know how your time is precious, so I appreciate you sharing it with us. Today, I have Cameron Camp from the Centers for Applied Research in Dementia, and we are discussing Montessori-style um, types of engagement for our loved ones. So thanks for joining me, Cameron. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. So you probably don't know, for the audience, Cameron and I did not do a pre-planning chat because he was recommended by past guests Donna Marenti and Angela Burrow, and he said any friend of theirs is a friend of his, so that's <laughs> beneficial to both of us. So the reason this podcast was started is because I was searching for ways to have better visits and better engagement with my mom and all of the traditional discussions, topics, you know, simplify their hobbies, da da da. No, you know, use the, you know, bring old family photo albums. None of that worked. <laughs> so, in doing deep internet research and reading as many books as I could manage, I, I came up with kind of a big zero. So, I'm really excited to talk to you today and learn what I wish I had known maybe five or six years ago. <laughs> oh yeah, it's it's the uh, the the Bob Seeger line. Wish I didn't know now what I didn't know then. But it's interesting that you should say that we have a book actually called A Different Visit. And it is designed specifically for family members and friends who are visiting a person with dementia or just memory impairments in general. And the idea behind it is to use Montessori principles as the basis of the visit, how to design the, the structure, the, the process of the visit. Maria Montessori was the first female physician in Italy, specialized in rehabilitative medicine as well as uh, pediatrics. So she used rehabilitation techniques as an educational system. She sort of stumbled into education. And there are now Montessori schools around the world. Uh, everything that we're talking about has been field tested for over a century. We're just applying these same principles to uh, working with persons with memory impairment, looking at how to engage them. So for example, today I was uh, giving an orientation uh, group uh, of new hires, uh, some training in dementia care. And I said to them, um, I have some little bitty small things of toothpaste and some small uh, toothbrushes from an airline uh, trip. Uh, I'm going to pair you up and the person on your left is going to brush your teeth and then you will brush the teeth of the person on the right. And, and I brought floss because this is very important. And the people that the people there know me well enough to know that I'm just crazy enough to ask them to do it. But we stop and I say, um, you know, the way you feel right now about someone else brushing your teeth, even though they're a caring, feeling professional, is the way a person with dementia feels if you brush their teeth. And what a gift it would be if we could enable them to recover the capacity to do it for themselves. Montessori said, everything you do for me, you take away from me. And everything turns on that. You know, if, if you've ever seen a parent that does everything for a child, it doesn't end well. And you can do it out of love, but it's very easy to teach dependence that way. And so, for example, uh, I gave a, a demonstration of how you would enable a person with dementia to brush their own teeth. And the answer is you come in with two toothpaste tubes and two toothbrushes. You do it step by step. So you take out your toothbrush and you hand one to them. And you put on some toothpaste on yours. They imitate. So you look, you're looking at breaking things down into step. This is task breakdown in, in the language of occupational therapy, uh, going from simple to complex. 
you demonstrate on your teeth, they demonstrate on, you know, they do it on theirs. And what happens is a person with dementia gets better with practice. You know, Montessori called it muscle memory, which is also what dancers call it, athletes call it. And so you can learn procedures, you get more confident, you get better with practice. You may forget the episode, but the results of the practice accumulate over time along with that confidence. So we can actually give people back capacities like brushing your own hair, brushing your own teeth, recovering ability to feed yourself. But it all starts with the understanding that a person with dementia can still learn. A person with dementia is a normal person who has a disability. So we, need, we need to look at dementia not as a disease medicalized process, but as a disability. And what that means is that our job then is to enable a person to circumvent their deficits and to be able to use the abilities they have as opposed to focusing on what they can't do. So for example, we talk about cognitive ramps, okay? Now, if, if you're driving down the street and you see a ramp that's built up in the front yard to somebody's house, you don't think anything of it. You say, you know, there's someone there who is say in a wheelchair and this lets them get into the house without having to go up steps or be carried up the steps. So for, for a person with dementia, cognitive ramps are things that allow you to circumvent your deficits. So for example, uh, I remember talking to a woman uh, who said, uh, you know, it's really sad, but when I come to, to visit uh, my husband, he doesn't know me anymore. He calls me by uh, his mother's name or his aunt's name. And, you know, what I told her was he knows you. He just can't name you. And there's a real, that's not a random choice of names. So what if you wear a name tag in large print when you come to visit and he can read that and call you by name? And that is a cognitive ramp. And I'll tell you, the nature of a relationship changes when a person can call you by name or when they can't. And we say it's a little thing that's a big thing. You know, another thing is, is for example, uh, I always talk to staff and I say, all right, so a person comes up to you and says, you know, my wife doesn't visit me anymore or my daughter. You know, they don't know if I'm alive or dead. Please call them. And of course, the person left 45 minutes ago after their visit. <laughs> And you they might not this. be even home. Oh, you yeah, know laugh. this. They're on the way. They're on the way home. See, and well, I laugh because when my mom was in memory care the first year ish, oh my goodness, all the ladies there they were demanding the phone and the yellow pages, which of course cracked me up because I'm not even sure they still print yellow pages anymore. But I that's what they remember though. It, yeah. So what we say is, uh, uh, you need to, if, if this is a community, right, you need to have a visitor center. You need to have a place where people can go who are coming for a visit, who can see what's coming up, who can figure out how to get to places, uh, but also how to have a good time. And so one of the things we talk about is, is what we call a visitor's book. This is a thing that I got actually in Oslo when I was giving a conference. But the idea is that you have to look at why the person is doing this, okay? And we call these things responsive behaviors as opposed to problematic behaviors. They are communication attempts. They are people who are dealing with an unmet human need. And most of the time in this, it's driven by some kind of fear. This is fear of being you know, forgotten, fear of, of being abandoned. And so how can we create a cognitive ramp to deal with this? And so a visitor's book, this says that the date and uh, today we talked about a game Wesley plays called You Taste Like. Yesterday, he said, you taste like a traffic light that doesn't work. Interesting thing for a three-year-old grandson to say. 
I will be back to see you in two days on June the 2nd. Love you, Linda. And then the resident signs his name. Okay. Because they will trust their handwriting, not yours. Uh, Montessori said, I welcome my mistakes. So this is how we learn. We've made so many of them. We've, we ought to be geniuses by now. So, and you have a ribbon like in this diary. And so when the person comes to uh, the staff member and says, call my wife, she doesn't know I'm here. The person has a script and they say, you know, there's probably a message about that in and for an external aid for a cognitive ramp, you ask them, what should we call this thing? And we use their words. Because that means that this is something they're familiar with, that terminology, as opposed to something we impose on it. It's always about them, not us. And so let's go see uh, uh, Linda's visits. And so we come. The person has had practice taking this to open it to the page. And you say, what does this say? And you have them read it. And you make sure the person can read the handwriting. We know how to fail. Uh, how do we know the content of an external aid is good? If it works. If, if this is what reduces their anxiety, it's the right content. See, And so when the person reads this and their anxiety is reduced, you say, that's right. Your wife is coming back in two days. And... Anytime you need to know when she's coming, we'll just go to Linda's visits. And two hours later, I need to talk to my what? But you do the same procedure again. And you have a script, so you don't have to remember what to say. And you hand this to second shift and the third shift. But with practice, what happens is when the person's anxiety rises, their feet carry them to the location where this thing is. And it helps to tie this thing with a string to the leg of the end table next to the bed so it won't be put in a safe place where no <laughs> one can find it. We've made yeah. all the mistakes. <laughs> and so they go to this location. Their hand, muscle memory, remembers to flip. They read. Ability to read hangs in there a long time in dementia. If the print's big enough, it's, it's good contrast. Reduces the anxiety. I mean, and, you've that makes taken sense. The, and you've taken the staff out of the loop. They're not needed. The person is yeah. able to reduce their own anxiety. <coughs> the daughter isn't getting the phone call on the way home <laughs> or the wife. And all it takes is paper and a different way of thinking. An understanding of how people with dementia can still learn and how to use these things. <coughs> Another thing that's important is that we emphasize doing things when you come for a visit. So is there something that, that you can do? So for example, uh, you could say, please tell me a story about something that happened when you were six years old. Tell me something that happened when I was six years old. And they dictate, you write it down, you go home again, a suggestion from a, a family resource center, a visitor center. You type it up in large print. How large should it be? Large enough for them to read it. They tell us if it's big enough. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you want sans serif font. And that is no little curly cues, thin lines at the bottom or top of letters, because thin lines are hard to see, especially in people with dementia. So Arial or Helvetica font. Uh, <coughs> bold. Print it out, and you have the six-year-old granddaughter illustrate the stories. You bring the granddaughter to the grandmother in the nursing home. The grandmother reads to the granddaughter stories about when this little girl's mother was her age, grandmother was her age. Children love family stories, whether they're six or 36. These are the stories that come out at Thanksgiving. Christmas, and you have a little girl who wants to visit a nursing home and isn't running up and down the hall's board. Yeah. <laughs> and the mother becomes the keeper of the family history. And you collect these stories. I mean, what an amazing gift for other generations. And 
instead of the daughter coming and saying, how you doing? How they treating you? What'd you have for breakfast? I don't remember. I don't think they fed me. We know the scenarios. Okay. There has to be a different approach, a different way of, of engaging. And so this is, this is what it's, it's all about. What if when the daughter comes uh, to visit the mom, uh, they decide and they talk to the uh, director, can they help spearhead a, a, a food drive for the hungry? And so what do you need? You need some collection bins. You put together some posters, you know, food here. You talk to the activity staff, send out a flyer. And then when you come for visits, you collect the food from the bins, you sort it out. And for an outing, you take the food to a food bank. My mom that's would have liked that. Kind of yeah, that's because we're at our best when we're doing things for people, for others. And that's, that's when you, you see a process that Montessori called normalization normalization she said when the person and the environment fit when the environment supports the strengths of the person gives them meaningful purposeful roles you see a normal person you circumvent the deficits everyone wants to feel normal you know when you're <laughs> sick you say i can't wait till i feel normal again <laughs> that's true and that's very true of people with dementia and I've heard it so many times. I've heard people tell my wife things like it, it really felt good to feel normal again. And so to be able to, to give those moments as part of a visit is, um, is a blessing, is a gift. And so it's all about giving people purpose, meaning, roles. You know, I mean, you can, there, there are all kinds of, of, of things that can be done. You know, you can, you can spearhead a, uh, a, uh, a, a walk for the hungry or a walk for the, for the uh, Alzheimer's Association that's done inside of the, uh, of the uh, 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 residential setting. Uh, you know, the limits are those of our imagination, and we haven't been very imaginative because we've been told that a person with dementia can't learn, that they won't get any better, that there's nothing much we can do about it. And that's just not true. Uh, there's, you know, I've been involved in four decades of research showing how people with dementia can learn, how we can train them. And, and now we're in the process of like translating this into visits and into personal care and, um, uh, and what we say is expect miracles. Hmm. You know, expect I like miracles. that. Yeah, yeah, and and it happens. I mean, it just happens. We're we're getting ready to uh, enable some residents with dementia to put on uh, puppet theater for uh, small children. Oh, it's perfect. Think about it. You know, you can you can even have a non-speaking character. You know, and, and and you're reading the script. You're underneath the stage, so they don't see you. Only the person you rehearse. You get better with practice. You ask them questions. Should should we should we let the wolf know where we're going? <laughs> so are you are you for this puppet show? Are you using traditional fairy tales that they probably remember as in like muscle memory? Yes, yes, you know, and and you know, long term memory hangs in there much, you know, better. Uh, things that we've learned in our childhood. I was in a reading and discussion group the other day, um, and we were talking about favorite TV shows, and so we were all singing the theme song from the Beverly Hillbillies together. <laughs> now, they may not have remembered what they had for breakfast, but we're all like, let me tell you a story about a man named Jed. <laughs> Poor mountaineer, barely kept his family. Everybody goes, fed. <laughs> yep. And the cement pond. Oh, dear. This, I remember that from go. my childhood. Yes, and yes, and yes. We can connect with those memories. That is a strength. Oh, okay. See, I wish somebody had told me this, you know, back in 2017, when after my dad passed away and... I became responsible for my mom and she would ask me, so what have you been up to lately? And I'd say, well, you know, it's Monday. I went to the gym and 
I did spin class. And she goes, what have you been up to lately? Oh, well, I went to Rotary. What have you been up to lately? Well, at Rotary, so-and-so spoke on whatever topic. And I would literally break down my day into chunks. And then I would tell her the entire day. And then after 20 minutes, I wanted to start banging my head on the wall, which is definitely not beneficial for anybody. <laughs> oh, you know, my, my mother-in-law had Alzheimer's disease and she came to stay with us for a summer while her son, who she'd been living with, was doing an internship at uh, the Cleveland Clinic. And so uh, he goes to, uh, to his work. And 30 minutes later, she says, you know, where's my son to my wife, uh, her daughter? And she says, oh, uh, he's at the, the Cleveland Clinic. He'll be back at 5.30. And then 20 minutes later, so where's my son? All right. My wife, Montessori teacher, more than 20 years, works with me, says, let's write this down. So she writes down, you know, his name is at the Cleveland Clinic. He'll be here back home at 5.30. And she says, what does this say? And she makes sure that her mom can read it. And she says, where shall we keep this? So they decided on the kitchen counter. They taped it down so it's not going to be taken and put to a safe place. And then 20 minutes later, where's my son? You know, there's a message about that. Let's go see. And they walk to this place. What does this say? Her mom reads it. It's the message that did the job. They calmed her down. That relieved her anxiety. She sees he's coming back hasn't left her here with these crazy people. Well, me at least. And an hour later, where's my son? Same procedure. If you want to learn a procedure, practice it the same way. You know, there's a message about that. Let's go see. People with dementia learn locations. There's a test for that in long-term care. Put somebody else in the chair at lunch that a other resident usually sits at and see what happens. <laughs> I see you've done the test or at least seen it done. Oh, I can relate. <laughs> yes. So who taught them that? Mm, that's a good question. They learned this after a diagnosis of dementia and after they moved into a strange place. People with dementia are learning all the time. We haven't been trained to see it to understand it, to use it, okay, uh, but it's there. And so what happened with her mother was after a couple of repetitions, she would later stand up, take herself over to that kitchen counter, read, her anxiety is reduced, comes back, and my wife's taken out of the loop. But it also like frees the person so that they're not constantly anxious and they can then focus their attention on, you know, on, on doing things, on activities, on, on helping shred the lettuce for, uh, for the salad. You know, if a person with dementia can read, they can read to you stories while you're preparing dinner, if you're taking care of someone at home, so that you know where they're at. You're not having to worry about cooking and what's going on in the other room. Uh, it also gives them a role so they can be reading like you know, humorous things or whatever you both enjoy. <sighs> See, we can use these abilities that are there and give people like a role and a function. And when a person is doing that, I know what they're not doing. They're not asking the same question over and over again. Yeah, which that gets old real quick. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. See, exactly. And so, you know, what we say is this is like a dose-dependent treatment. The amount of time that a person is engaged in meaningful activity is the amount of time that they won't be exhibiting responsive behavior. And so it's just a matter of, you know, how many engaging things do you want, you know, to give? I was talking with a woman and she said, you know, my husband, I, I put up these notes in the house. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. <laughs> and, and then he goes out and he, he takes everybody's newspapers from around the block and brings them home. So I've got another note to write. And I said, you know, instead of playing whack-a-mole, what if you had notes that said, do this, do this, please help me with this. You have a husband who wants to help. And all you're telling him is what he's not able to do. And then you're asking this guy, 
with cognitive impairments to figure out for himself what he should do. What if we flip this? What if we flip this? What if we what if we give like a structured set of things to do that would be helpful? Which See, is it's, yeah. it's better because how do we feel when somebody says, "Don't do this, don't do that." Now, Cameron, don't do that. Jennifer, you know, please go sit down. You know, we get we get irritated, we get a little and, little feisty, and, and I can learn to dislike you pretty quickly. Yeah, that is very true. <laughs> and I may not know why, and it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter. I mean, we tell staff, you know, residents are going to learn to like you or to hate you. They're going to learn something. So why not enable them to like you? It's, it's like we say before, give people choices, you know, as opposed to just saying, you know, it, and, and give choices that are meaningful, not, not something like, what would you like to wear today? But would you like to wear this blouse or this blouse? And then even if they can't speak, they can point, okay? But you feel differently about the clothes you wear if you pick them out. You know, the, quality of, the quality of life that you have is based to a large extent on how much choice you have in your life. I don't think and I've so, ever thought about it that way, but that is very true. We're just so the, blessed that we have choices most of the time that we don't, we're not aware that we have all these choices. That's a nice little tidbit. <laughs> it's, it's our sense of control over our lives. And when we feel out of control, that's when we're not happy and when we get feisty. You know, sometimes the only time a person with dementia has the ability to try to exercise control is by saying no. And, you know, I tell people, if if I have dementia and you and I think you're trying to control my life, I'm going to say no a lot. And you're not going to like me. And I'll tell you, I sure as hell won't like you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing because the more help my mom needed the less she wanted, which was obviously a control situation. And most of my listeners should probably remember that we have a very strong family trait of control freakism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Both sides, all around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everybody's a control freak. <laughs> it doesn't always make for pleasant Thanksgiving meals. But she um, she would start scratching people and drawing blood. So she was real yeah, yeah. fun. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. This is This is human stuff. We we have a we have a trademark that we use at the center. It's a human thing. And what we say is that, you know, this is you or I under the same circumstances. This this is not about dementia. This is how people act when they feel like someone's trying to take control away from them. You know, you fight back. You know, in in long-term care, it's the person who comes in who's absolutely passive who dies first. You chat with people who've been in the field for a while and they'll just nod their heads. And the person who's feisty, they live the longest because they still have this will to live and they want to control as much as they can. This is human stuff. All right. I'm laughing because you said my mom had a will to live. And there were times she had a will for me not to continue living when she would tell me to drop dead or <laughs> drop dead and get the heck out of here. Yep. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I've heard that many times myself. You know? Fortunately, I think I only heard it a couple times. And I've learned things like she refused like 1000% to walk next to me. You could not hold her hand. You could not do elbow in elbow. If she was 10 paces behind you and you slowed down, she would slow down. If you stopped, she would stop. It was just beyond frustrating. And I just recently learned, because my mom was the oldest of four children, that, and, you know, we all know that I'm the oldest, so we all have, we're, we're, we're responsible for our siblings yes. a lot. And she was probably walking behind so she could keep an eye on what was going on with the kids. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. I started using a product that all you caregivers need to try. I started taking AG1 from Athletic Greens after my workouts because I needed a quick and healthy way to refuel my body. While there are lots of options, most don't taste great. 
and I don't eat or drink things that don't taste good. So what is AG1? Well, with one delicious, mildly tropical flavored scoop, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins and minerals, whole food sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to fuel you for your crazy day ahead. AG1 helps support mental clarity throughout the day and you know how important brain health is to this gal. It has over 7,000 five-star reviews and costs less than $3 a day. And you know your time is worth more than three bucks. Athletic Greens was created when the founder experienced a ton of gut health issues and ended up on a complicated supplement routine to recover. I'm sure you're aware that there may be a connection between poor gut health and dementia, so this is another way to help protect your brain. As caregivers to someone with a cognitive impairment, this is also an excellent way to get much needed nutrition into someone who is slowly losing the ability to eat. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D, which is also important for brain health, and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is go to athleticgreens.com slash emerging. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash emerging to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Now back to our conversation. Had to, had to. This is like an old, old habit. I mean, this is like who your mom was. This mm-hmm. is this is literally who she was, and to say don't do that. <laughs> oh, was fr- I was just so afraid that she was going to face plant into the sidewalk, and then you know the general population would look at me as a horrible monster that didn't let her catch up, and oh, it's just oh, it was so stressful. <laughs> I, <laughs> and I, I wish I had known you. that because yeah. I'm like. I could have play acted and turned around and said, oh, hey, did you see that bird going by or whatever? Instead of being stressed about, you know, how close is she? You know, I'd like use my phone to keep an eye on her so that, you know, because, oh, God, it was like I said, it was stressful. Yes. But see, my mom thought I was her best friend, which, you know, I thought that was a pretty good. That's you know, not bad. No, I, I didn't complain about that one. So we would do a lot of things like we'd go to the park and watch kids play or we'd go to the pool and watch kids swim, which I know sounds creepy. We did it. Occasionally, I would take her to the library to watch, you know, because if the weather was I know we're in Northern California, people don't think we have somebody asked me today, isn't it always warm there? And I'm like, God, I wish (laughs) (laughs) not currently. It's like 69 degrees today. It's supposed to be in the mid eighties in a couple of days. And then it's going back to the seventies. Yeah. It's springtime in California when the weather bounces everywhere and you got to have all your wardrobe out of the, you know, in the closet. No, no seasonal stuff put away, but yeah, I just, I really wish I had known that little tidbit because it would have made things so much easier. That's why I like to talk to people like you because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ideas. I don't know. And I would have liked to have been able to test if my mom could have read something maybe written large in like dark black Sharpie. Yep. Um, because her visual processing was just trash, just trash. And she was always like, when I tried to simplify hobbies that she loved, she was very creative. She she was a seamstress. She had done painting. She did wood woodworking in her the later years of her life before it became a really big deal that she couldn't because danger. Yeah. And so I would always try to do like simple art projects, not color in a coloring book because that's childish. And she kind of recognized that. And she also couldn't tell what was inside the lines, what was outside the lines. Sure. But she was always afraid of doing it wrong. She would oh, yeah. fuss and stress about doing it wrong. I'm like, you can't do this wrong. Just throw paint wherever. It's not a big deal. <laughs> so we do our work around the world. We have training partners throughout Europe. We've done a lot of work with Dementia Australia. We're just starting to do work in New Zealand, uh, all across North America, training partner in Brazil. So we're going to the south of France. Ah, I'll in, go with uh, you. <laughs> in Provence and Montpellier, in a place that's been using Montessori approaches for a long time, uh, we create resident committees. And the, and the residents do use this to control their own lives. So they have a food committee. And they decide menus. 
And they decided that in the summer, in the south of France, when it's hot, they wanted to have a light meal for dinner, something like vegetable soup. So a subcommittee was formed, the soup committee, <laughs> to prepare the vegetables for the evening meal. And so uh, can you see that on the screen? I Epo can, and I'm trying to trying to resurrect the French lessons I had uh, Pre in middle school. <laughs> the vegetables for the soup for the of the evening. Yeah, it was that first word. A pluchage. A pluchage. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so, this is what it looks like. Oh, so we have an older woman peeling carrots. That gal looks like she's okay. She's drinking. What is she doing with the green beans? <laughs> this is a lady. There's a there's a thing called the MMSE, Mini Mental Status Exam. Mm hmm. Scores from zero to 30, 23 or below some evidence of dementia. This lady with the green beans has an MMSE taken at this time of zero. Nope. My mom, I had my mom got one of those scores. <laughs> yep. And if that's all you knew about her, you know, would you think of her as a candidate for the soup committee? But her nope. hands remember what to do, muscle memory, to be able to work with green beans. Yep, she's pulling off the stems. Yep. That's amazing. Because you can tell just by the video that she's definitely in a later stage of the disease. Yeah. This gal's grabbing, what is that, a parsnip? Yep. <laughs> that gal reminds me of my grandmother. She's and, working and of with... of course, she's got the sharp knife. But, you know, I tell people she's less likely to cut herself than you are. <laughs> That's probably true. Decades worth of experience with this. And then we stop and we say, where's the dementia? If you didn't know that these people had dementia, how would you know? Then the second thing we ask is, are they suffering? Yeah, you see, you hear a lot of terminologies, patient, a patient, a dementia sufferer, an Alzheimer's sufferer. But, you know, that's on us. That's on the kind of life that we provide or don't provide. These people are not suffering. They are members of a community. They're doing these things for their community. They have purpose. When I talk about purpose, this is what it looks like. This is what normalization looks like. And then the next thing we say is, where are the staff? The That's answer a good is question. Doing, doing a great job. You know, Montessori said, everything you do for me, you take away from me, as I said before. This is what it looks like. They have prepared the environment to enable these residents to perform this task independently. That's what a good job looks like for staff. Now, it's a very different role. Do we have that an issue with, you know, like, I know when my mom was in the memory care residence, there was a lot of family members that just, they needed a, they needed a good talking to, but... I can see them being really freaked out that this woman has a sharp knife. Do we have issues with um, like insurance? Like, I've Yeah. So what you do is a couple of things. You can do a risk assessment. You can put a glove on, on one hand if you want to, but uh, you know, you could also put this lady in bubble wrap and keep her in a closet for safety's sake. It's about finding that balance between Safety and quality of life. That reminds me, and I don't know if you're aware of this. Did you know that crystal, like your qu crystal wine glasses, crystal gets brittle if it doesn't get used. But if yeah, yeah. you use it regularly, it's actually stronger than glass. Yeah. So we should maybe think of these people as crystal crystals. that needs to be used. <laughs> yes, that's exactly it. Now, this lady is very interesting. She has advanced dementia. She has had a stroke. She is paralyzed on her right side. If that was all that you knew about her, would you think of her as a member of a soup committee? No, but and she's this, apparently going to peel a carrot with her left hand and the carrots this, on the table. This little table thing here was, was created by the woman who runs uh, dishwashing at the nursing home. But she saw this lady and she's part of the team. We don't believe in silos. And so uh, 
she made this at home and from the bottom she drilled up uh, nailed up nails so that you can pat down and hold a carrot still and that enables you to peel it using only one arm and she's just another one of the girls hmm. preparing the carrots keep... oh and she's turning it too of did course. She a, did she get the whole thing peeled? Yes, of course. Wow. I could have used that thing about six years ago when I flew off my bike and broke my collarbone. Yes, Man, only this, having one, one arm is no fun. <laughs> this is a cognitive ramp. This this is rehab, all right? This is occupational therapy. She decides on which peeler she wants. This will work better. So she had a stroke, so she's got memory deficit as well as the paralysis. And it doesn't the hell matter. No, it doesn't show other than you could tell that her right arm doesn't work because it's laying in her lap. So this but is what we're talking about. When we look at dementia as a disability rather than a disease, when we look at remaining capacities rather than deficits, when we look at providing meaningful engaging activity and social roles. She's a member of the community. And a final thing, you know, did she have this platform here in her kitchen when she was a young wife? Probably not. She only encountered this after she had dementia and a stroke. And yet she has learned at this time in her life, a new way of peeling carrots. And I always tell people the next time, uh, I'll let you be be the host again. <laughs> the next time you think about the statement, persons with dementia cannot learn, please remember this woman. Because yeah, it is definitely. simply not true. It's just not true. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So this is this is what we're about. This is about changing the way people think about dementia, changing what they see enabling people to use capacities that they have, giving people purpose and meaning and the ability to live well with dementia. You know, we work with people literally on the day they die, engaging them and showing staff and families how to engage them using this approach, enabling people to be their best selves, persons with dementia and those who are their care partners. It's about a way of living. And we're just applying it in this population here. So that is kind of sort of, you know, who we are and what we do. Uh, but we don't, you know, I told people, I don't have a job. I have a mission. Yeah, I can relate. <laughs> There's a difference. And, uh, you know, it's about trying to change the world. It's trying, it's about trying to change the very way we think and view the world and, and the people around us. And you know, we have a we have a Montessori pledge that we ask you know people to to consider taking when they work with us. Uh, I will work to create the kind of place I would want to live. I will remember I must earn the trust of others. They must learn to trust me. I will uh, remember I'm a guest in the home of uh, residents. I will try to be a good guest. Uh, I, you know, if you have a bad guest in your home, you, know, <laughs> you like don't ask take, them back. <laughs> and, and, and they take over the TV and the whole nine yards. And, you know, when I have bad guests, I go to my room and I stay there. <laughs> <laughs> this is human stuff. Uh, it says I will use uh, the Montessori principles in everything that I do. Things like always demonstrate give choice, give meaning, move at their speed, give people something to hold. Uh, and uh, I will treat everyone I meet with respect, dignity, and equality, the key roles. And then finally, I will treat people the way I wish to be treated. Yep. And we need a lot more of that nowadays. Yeah. And you see, what happens is it spills over beyond like a job or beyond visits. It's about like giving children choice at home. Like which of these which chores that we need to have done would you like to do? As opposed to clean out the trash can. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so this is this is this is what we do. It's interesting. I've seen residents in memory care create their own Montessori pledge. I will work to make this the kind of place where everyone wants to live. I will treat everyone that I live with with respect and dignity and equality. It's a cool thing to see it take hold. And uh, I, yeah. I can believe that one of the challenges, and this is typical, I think, in most memory communities, is there was one resident who, if she put her eyeballs on it, it was hers. My mom's yeah, dog, yeah. your purse, yeah, yeah. maybe your hat. And, you know, obviously, if she managed to get her hand on it, now you got a wrestling match because you don't want oh, her sure. to run off with your purse. So and she, it's hers, so why are you trying to take my stuff away from me? Yeah, so I learned if I saw her coming, I, I made sure to, to keep my stuff within my own grasp. But how would – I'm trying to think how – so are you – my brain is – scrambling for words here now, i know exactly what you're talking about <laughs> these people are archetypes and i've seen this kind of situation around the world so you know first off we always when we encounter a responsive behavior we start by asking the question why is this happening and the answer can never be because they have dementia how do we know they have dementia? Because this is happening. Why is this happening? Because they have dementia. That ain't going to help anybody. No. And, and as a researcher, circular logic drives me nuts anyway. So why is this person doing this? Okay. And, you know, many times this goes back to poverty, trauma, you know, uh, it, it's interesting. My, my, my stepmother, when, my dad and she would visit us from Tennessee and we lived in uh, New Orleans. They would stop and spend the night and then come to us. And she would bring toilet paper from the motel. Oh, you know? dear. This, this was like <laughs> years and years ago. And I'm like, oh, my God, what the hell? But, you know, having gone through a pandemic now, that makes yeah. a hell of a lot of sense. But, I mean, she went through a depression and all this stuff. So, it's a need. I mean, I, I know of a, a situation where a woman had grown up in foster homes. And when you asked her, why do you need this? She would say for the children. And no one had like, you know, asked her why she was doing this. So like one of the things we say is to at, talk to people and ask them why they need this. What's it for? Try to understand the motivation. And then, of course, we do two things. Uh, we check it, see if they can read. Most of the time they can read. So we label things. We put her name on things. Okay. So this allows her to fill the need. And we give her like a really great uh, Nordstrom shopping bag with her name on it to keep the stuff in. So that instead of being viewed as the crazy lady who's a thief, <laughs> she's this amazing shopper you know and all of the stuff that she has has her name on it so she's obviously not stealing and then of course you can always like recycle it you know as mm -hmm. a buy because they forget that it's in their room but you also label things like you know this belongs to see most of the time if a person believes that something belongs to somebody else they're not going to take it but you know, if you've ever seen a Christmas story, the movie, you know, mm -hmm. that they play when Randy, the little brother comes down Christmas morning, all the presents are there. And he goes and he says, oh, that's mine. And that's mine. And that's mine. And that's mine. If it's all yours, then, you know, you take it. But if something is labeled not yours or please leave here property of, then a person has to make a conscious decision to be a thief to take it. And most people won't do that cognitive ramps. How can people know what's theirs and not theirs? How can we give external cues in the environment to enable them to meet their needs, to be able to guide them so that they can feel comfortable that they're not going to go without food or that the children won't go without food or yeah. See, my Why mom likes to take about three or four feet of toilet paper, accordion, fold it, and she would stuff it in this, 25 year old purse 
or in her dresser drawer. Yes. Yeah, oh, I've, I've encountered bananas. this. I've encountered this. And so what we would do is we would get a pyramid of toilet paper rolls with a person's name on it in the bathroom and a sign. These are yours. Please you know, help yourself. These belong to and a shopping bag and a purse. I've seen people carry like four, not just accordion size. Hell, I've got four whole rolls <laughs> and I've got them right here and I've got a bag to carry them in. It's, it's called the Tai Chi defense. You flow with it. You don't find yeah, I didn't it. do that. <laughs> you, you, know, you, you find a way to guide it and then see if they have this. If they're not worried about running out of what's so critical, that frees them once again to be able to like take part in other things, take part in programming. And the people around them aren't going to say, hide your stuff. Uh, <laughs> this is a, a really cool shopper who has all of this stuff that she's carrying around, but not a thief. It's a, it's well, a way of thinking. It's a way of thinking. Why is this happening? How can we use external aids, cognitive ramps, the abilities to learn, use the abilities that still remain, look for the root cause of this and address the root cause. That makes sense. Cause I remember trying to, they always wanted everything of my mom's, you know, all the residents had to have everything labeled and that's not how my mom lived. So I always labeled it small for the staff now I realize I probably should have labeled it big for my mom. <laughs> whatever works, you know, whatever works is what we say. Right way, wrong way. We let go of all of that. Okay. Whatever works for this person at this moment, because they change and they're mm -hmm. different in the morning than the afternoon. You have to just go with the flow and whatever works. But we have a lot of rabbits we can pull out of the hat. And we have a lot of experience you know, doing these kinds of things and, and helping people with you know, very specific issues. Because I have to tell you, after 40 years in this game, thinking this way, it's, it's hard to surprise me anymore. <laughs> and we have friends around the world who are doing these things. And if I can't think of something to do, I send out an email and I hear from other people who've, uh, who've been able to, to be successful working with this. That's wonderful. So now, do you have any recommendations, like reading recommendations for people who want to get better at doing this? Like I would have loved to gotten, have gotten better at doing this for my mom. Sure. Uh, I would send people to our website and that's uh, www.cen for center, C-E-N, the number four, A-R-D, for applied research in dementia.com. So www.cen, the number four, ard.com. Uh, we have lots of resources, many of them free. Um, we have the book, A Different Visit, that I mentioned before. I shouldn't tell you this, but you can get it from Amazon for cheaper, and you can even download one for a very inexpensive price. Uh, okay, we won't mention this linked in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, uh, we have uh, online coursework. We have a two-hour course on responsive behaviors we've developed with Florida State University's uh, School of Medicine uh, that's uh, available out there. Uh, we have uh, training in Montessori approaches for dementia, how to engage. We have uh, activity books uh, that are available, download or, or, or uh, uh, print. Uh, online coursework that's uh, that provides CEUs for people in different disciplines. We have a whole bunch of stuff. And then, you know, <laughs> a, a place where people can write us if they have questions. I'll just give you a real quick example. So we got a, an email from a woman who said, uh, we live out in the Midwest, we're farmers. And every day at three, my husband, who has uh, dementia, we're in our 80s, says, I have to go milk dad's cow. Well, dad's not there. Cal's not there. I took him to the barn, showed him it was empty. And he said, that can't be my dad's barn. My dad's barn has a cow in it. <laughs> Logic's on his side. If She says, if I distract him and then it's five o'clock, he goes, oh, my God, I didn't milk the cow. What am I supposed to do? All right. Did you tell her to buy a cow? 
there is a less expensive approach. Okay, that's probably good. <laughs> it all boils down to why is this happening? It's and habit. A, it, yeah, and here's a hint. It has nothing to do with the cow. Okay, so he it, needed a purpose at 3 o'clock in the morning. Three, well, three in the afternoon. Oh, in the afternoon. That's better. <laughs> but it's all about not disappointing his father. Oh, see, even I didn't pick up on that one. That's why I like to talk to people like you. And so we talked to her, and what she did was she wrote a letter, mailed it to uh, their themselves, and and she said, you know, I, and she told us before, I told him that his father had passed away. He called me a liar. So they got this letter in the mail. Dear son, thank you for all the years you helped with the farm and for milking the cow. I'm getting old now. Hell, so are you. I have <laughs> sold the cow. I am using the money to take your mom on a long vacation. Thank you so much. No need to worry about it anymore. Love, Dad. And that worked? And that made sense to him. And he would keep it in his pocket, the letter. And when he would start to say, you know, I, I need to uh, milk the cow, the wife would say, you know, I think there's a letter from your dad about that. You know, just like with my wife and it's the same principle. <laughs> same script. His, <laughs> the muscle memory he would pull this out. He would read it. This is the content that re reduced his anxiety, met his need. Bada bing, bada boom. And you didn't have to buy a cow. Yeah, that's a lot easier than buying a cow. <laughs> it's always the same. Why is this happening? What is the root cause? How can we create external aids, circumvent the deficits to address the needs and to free the person to reduce? enable them to reduce their own anxiety so that then they can engage with other stuff and, and not go into this repetitive cycle that just frustrates everybody. We, we, we are not powerless in the face of dementia. Well, that's an excellent place to stop. I really appreciate this. I'm glad that Donna and Angela recommended you. And I emailed you right after we recorded that. And then you scheduled this. So this is, this is, this is why I do this because we need to talk about this more and it's happening a lot more now than it did five years ago and 10 years ago. My mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years. Yep. So I, I should have a PhD, but I don't, I still have you, a lot of have, questions. You have earned one, you know, yeah. it, uh, it, it, you earned it on the streets, but uh, you've got the, you've got the qualifications and you learned it the hard way. Yep. And I'm still learning. So I know that. You guys are all providing really wonderful advice and inspiration to the listeners. So I thank you very much for being part of the show today. And everybody needs to check out that website because I've looked at it and it is really quite, it's got a lot of great resources for all of us. Thank you so much for the invitation to do this. Uh, it was a joy and, uh, you know, I wish you well and I'll be, I would be happy to come back again sometime. Awesome. Thank you. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.